Ben, it would be awesome if you could just give us a bit of an introduction on how you got into tech. Ooh, uh, convoluted story. Uh, so I've, throughout my entire career, professional career, maybe my entire life, I've always done stuff the hard way. So uh, I went to school while on active duty in the US military um, to study nuclear engineering and uh, hated it, like absolutely hated it. Got out of the Navy after 10 and a half years uh, went to work in the only company that would hire somebody with uh, my limited skill set uh, as it applies to civilian life, which is a factory um, as a process engineer, whatever that means. Uh, it meant working on robotics processes uh, and basically just tuning a line. So thinking about what is sort of the hardcore old school way of optimization problems and hated that, went to do it at another company and for a much more complex process, uh, growing LEDs and learned a whole bunch of stuff about how much data is available in complex systems and started to uh, take a bunch of classes about how to do what I have always done pretty well, which is be as lazy as possible in order to automate things that I hate doing. So. <laughs> I learned about regression problems. Like, hey, how do I figure out how to do this super annoying thing that I can't stand doing manually? Uh, so started learning that stuff, wrote some truly terrible code that would break in an almost daily basis. And over the years, working for a couple other factories, uh, went into a position which would now be called a data science position. Uh, at that time was, we called them yield engineers. Uh, or yield analysis engineers. So it's looking at an entire factory process of one of the biggest factories in North America. And um, how do you figure out root cause analysis of problems in that factory? So it necessitated learning how to write code that sucked less than what I was doing before. So learned it the hard way, bought a bunch of books, tried a bunch of stuff until eventually I, I got hired as a data scientist at a company that had never had data scientists before and um, just got thrown all these projects and had to figure it out. That's where I got exposure to Apache Spark and Databricks. I uh, got so much attention from that that uh, they hired me uh, as a field engineer. And I've been there ever since, uh, working with companies both very small and ludicrously large on helping them with everything from ETL to uh, machine learning production use cases. Excellent. I think about half or 70% of the people watching related to that idea of doing things, being as lazy as possible and figuring out how to do things that you don't want to do. How can I automate this? So if you can relate, let us know. And again, I'll just say this for people trickling in, we're giving away one of Ben's books and the way that you can win it is by asking the best question. So ask some questions, let us know. Today, we were planning on talking all about monitoring. Before we jump into that, I was watching some videos that you did and you talked about the human aspect of machine learning and ML ops. And I wanted to zoom in on that a little bit and get your take on the human aspect when it comes to projects, doing machine learning, getting models into production. I think we as a profession spend a lot of cerebral capacity on focusing on the technological aspect of it. What algorithm am I gonna use? How am I gonna craft the perfect feature vector? Um, how can I get more data to, to get a, a model that performs better, that doesn't overfit? And we get so caught up in that tech aspect of it. We, it becomes esoteric when we're talking to a business and it, it becomes so esoteric and, and so complex to communicate that and to translate how we think about problems into terms that the business understands. Uh, not having that bridge of being able to communicate to a lay person or somebody who's running a business, uh, executive level people at a company who need to fund you, fund your department and your future work. Th that's the real key, I think, in, 
in ML production, more so than any cool platform or technology or algorithm. It's really in how do we communicate the focus that we really should be having, which is on solving a problem, regardless of what it is, regardless of the technology that we're using, how do we solve it by including the people from the business who know more about it than we're ever going to know about it, learn from them and build it together with the business, but translate everything in terms that the business understands and focus more on that human component than on the technology. Mm. This echoes something that we've been hearing so much. And it's actually a question that I've raised a few times. And it first came up about a year ago when we were interviewing Charles Martin and he was talking about how ML ops is an organizational problem. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was talking that it wasn't a problem when it comes to we don't have the right tools. It's that I can't get access to my data or I'm having trouble understanding what people are actually looking for. You don't have a translator from the business to the technical. So there's so much that goes into it. And it feels like you're basically saying that same thing. Yeah. I I mean, I I devote the first whole section of the book into this problem, which is drawing from my experiences of all the ways that I've screwed this up in previous companies. And, and I have made a lot of mistakes in this area and learn from them. So listen to my wisdom. Um, But I, I, because I work with so many companies now, I see this problem happen at organizations, both big and small, which is how do you collaborate with the business in order to make sure that there's a Rosetta stone that has been created between the groups and having that common translation and approaching the problem from that collaborative perspective. And that involves processes that about, I mean, I I delve into it in the the book about how often should I schedule meetings? What should we Mm -hmm. talk about in these meetings when we're talking about an ML project and how should I actually phrase what I'm working on and uh, craft demonstrations that are in the context of of what the problem that is being solved uh, and giving some funny demonstrations in the book about things that I've built. So I'm like, hey, check out this cool RMSE graph and with almost no labels on it and show it to a marketing team. And they look at it as if they're meeting an alien for the first time. They're like, what <laughs> is this? Uh, and then showing how you can craft that in a different way, which is hey, I'm extrapolating or inferring from my predictions how this will impact your, the goals for your department and then making sure that visualizations and reports are generated in a way that communicate in that same way throughout the entire life cycle. And that was some of the, one of the topics that we were going to talk about today, which was when the thing's in production, don't do that RMSE report. They don't care. Nobody cares except the data science team communicated in the, hey, we're measuring engagement uh, of what this model is being used for. So all of the attribution metrics associated with that that project are about engagement or profit or revenue or whatever, whatever you choose. Yeah, it's really the stakeholders, right? Knowing what the stakeholders yep. in each piece of the puzzle is really are really looking for and what matters to them so that you can go to them and show them what they're looking for, or what they care about. Yep. So Definitely. this is awesome. I like, I like where we're going with this. And I also noticed that you had said in one of these past talks that you gave, there is a fragility to models that get put out into production, or sometimes they don't even make it into production because they aren't strong enough. They don't, past the tests. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any, do you have like a, a few stories of these models and why they've been like, maybe can you tell us about some fragile models that you've come across? Sure. All of them. Um, (laughs) and that, that's the thing that, that disappoints a lot of people, teams that I talk to, um, they're like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna build this perfect model, and then we're just gonna release it to production. I'm like, okay, uh, when are you gonna retrain it? Uh, when how are you gonna monitor the the effects on your label if it's a supervised learning problem? 
-hmm. And I get these blank stares for a team that hasn't really put stuff into production before. Nobody really talks about the fact that, hey, these things are not stable. Um, And there's a number of reasons for that. Typically, when we're building a model, we're influencing reality. We're trying to affect change in the world in a beneficial way to our, our company, whatever project we're working on. So there's intrinsic feedback that's, that's present. If we make a prediction and the team that we're doing this prediction for takes an action on that, let's say we're doing churn. And I see this with churn models all the time. Fraud models are even worse, but uh, if we do a churn model, we're analyzing a, a customer's return frequency uh, or engagement with our company. If we're flagging a high value customer as saying, hey, there's a high probability that they're gonna churn here. Nobody just looks at that prediction and says, okay, cool. They're going to take action on it. They're going to do something. They're going to engage with that customer, try to bring them back, give them free stuff, send them a bunch of spam emails that hopefully they'll open one of them and re-engage with the company. Well, you've just affected the training data. Um, and you, you might not capture that, that fact that there was an outside influence. There's a latent factor that now influenced the feature behavior. So there's a loop that's happening. That means that training has to adapt to that, or you have to add an additional feature to your model to say, we intervened on this date and time. This is the type of action that we did so that the model can understand that there was this translation that that occurred. But any other model, if we're we're talking about fraud, uh, which is a very common model that a lot of people build or systems, ensembles that people build, uh, that's a constant war and battle that people are fighting against effectively criminals. Humans are creative. Uh, They will attempt to reverse engineer the ways that your model is detecting their activity, and they will adapt to try to trick that model so that it doesn't flag that behavior. So because of this, these new vectors of information that are coming in constantly, the model will not be able to to classify those unless it's been retrained or adapted. So some amount of analysis has to occur. And the way that you trigger that is by monitoring monitoring mm-hmm. all of the the performance metrics associated with that model not the score of its correlation ability of saying yeah we, we correlate perfectly to the target it's more trying to see how it that reality impacting relationship between your prediction and the real world uh, happens can we talk about the idea of these fraud cases a little bit more because i've heard this come up quite a bit and I know that it is a huge use case for machine learning. And what you're saying is that someone who is trying to do fraudulent things, they recognize the model will flag them if they do certain things. And Mm -hmm. so then they say, okay, well, what if we do it this way? Is that how it is? And they're basically looking for loopholes in the model. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're a hacker, trying to get free stuff, you're going to try a bunch of stuff. You're going to, a lot of these people that are sophisticated in this, they approach problems the same as we do. They are using a scientific method of saying, I have 30 hypotheses. I think that if I create an account on this platform and then immediately start doing some pretty shady stuff that I think that I'm going to get flagged and my, my account is going to get locked. So they'll test that. They'll use a burner account. They'll try it and they'll, they'll validate and say, yep, I, I totally got caught on this or this, this account got caught. So then they'll start doing some testing and then exploring a design of experiments effectively. And they'll say, well, what if I wait 30 minutes from account creation to starting to do this activity very slowly? Well, what if I wait an entire day? Or what if I do a bunch of, uh, a bunch of activities that make me look like a normal user? and simulate normal human behavior. And after doing that for two weeks, I start doing crazy illegal stuff. Uh, What if I try to do chargeback uh, things if I'm dealing with e-commerce and I I buy a bunch of stuff and I make it look legitimate for a while. And then all of a sudden I just order a bunch of stuff in a short period of time. And then just say that all of that, that, uh, that stuff didn't get delivered to me and and call my bank and have all those, those uh, charges waived. So scammers do this stuff a lot and they they approach things in very creative ways so if you're going to build a model like that you're in a 
you're in a constant state of conflict with people who are very clever, very sophisticated. And if your model's not monitoring this and not checking that, then it's going to become very fragile and just break and it's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So there are a few different cases of monitoring that I wanted to get into. And I know we, for the specific time that we have together now, we wanted to really dig into that, the monitoring once it's out into production. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on data monitoring and also just when you're training the model, that monitoring, the monitoring of the training too. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's the middle section of the book, actually. It covers a lot of this stuff. There's, there's probably almost 200 pages devoted to that because um, it's so critical. It's such an important part of, of making sure that model drift and the five different types of model drift are being monitored correctly. And that the feature input, uh, making sure that you're checking your distribution to say, when I did this, when I did my, my prototype and I, I worked towards developing a production grade version of this model, there's some snapshot that you have of whatever that training happened before first release. Uh, collect statistics on it, figure out what is the shape and nature of this data, where is this Gaussian distributed, or is this, you know, some sort of distribution that is so ex exceedingly tailed that I want to capture that, that shape of that. Uh, one of the ways that I do it is actually try to fit and then do a KS test, all these standard models and say, which one does this match most closely to and record that. I'll actually log that to MLflow. Uh, for each feature. And I'll say, this feature is a couchy. This feature is a half couchy. This is a, a logarithmic or log normal. And you can use that to monitor the features over time. Once you release it to production, you can say, all right, I'm going to take the last two weeks of data on this particular feature every day. I'm just going to do a rolling window and make sure that I still have a similar distribution. In addition to doing stuff like seeing is the mean drifting is my variance drifting and just doing checks with with regards to that and if it goes above a threshold of comfort uh, um, you can flag that as saying all right everybody wake up it's 2 a.m things are going poorly for this model we need to fix this or we need to kick off retraining you can do more advanced stuff where you have an auto feedback loop and, you, and you're saying all right, because I'm seeing this drift occur in my feature set coming in, I'm very concerned that my, my prediction capability is not so great. I'm going to immediately trigger CICD to go through and, and initiate a blue-green deployment. And I'm going to run an A-B test automatically. I don't typically recommend people doing that from the scratch, like from the start, because it's very complex. It's mm -hmm. easier to just go through and have a human validate all that stuff. But the important part is, having the metrics to monitor that, uh, all your data coming in, always looking at that, but also everything that's coming out. If you're doing a regression problem, what is the nature and shape of, of doing a prediction on two weeks of data, a month of data, whatever you use for validation, make sure that that's stable over time, not just looking at what is my mean value over time. Uh -huh. There's a lot I want to get into there because you, you said a few different things that I, I wanted to ask about. One is the importance of knowing what to monitor for. And I have another guest on the show and she talks a lot about is it Lena, who is like my go-to monitoring person. And she talks a lot about how knowing what to monitor for is more important than the tools that you use to monitor. Yes. So I want to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. The recommendation that I always give is making sure to check for the five major types of drift. And she's 100% correct. It doesn't matter what tool you use. Uh, I mean, it does with respect to the volume of data that you're dealing with. We're talking about a terabyte of prediction data that you're processing a day. You're probably using Apache Spark to do that structure streaming, something like, like of that nature. If you're predicting a couple hundred thousand rows, it doesn't matter what technology you're using. It doesn't matter what APIs you, you use, what fancy tool. It just means knowing that the structure of how drift can occur needs to be looked at um, with respect to 
what is my distributions associated with the continuous variable, or if I'm doing categorical, um, like multivariate classification, what are my counts? Are those stable? And then running a, an old school statistical test. Uh, and most of the stuff people aren't really talking about too much over the last couple of years, except for in communities such as yours that focus on on this stuff, which they should. Um, but in the zeitgeist of ML globally, I don't hear a lot of people talking about this, um, unfortunately. But a lot of these tools and techniques, they're very old. Uh, we're talking about centuries old that some of this stuff was was originally invented back when people were using pencils and paper to, to do all this stuff. And it's old school statistics. Um, looking at stuff like Fisher's exact test, rank sum uh, to determine, is there an equivalency here? What, can I get a p-value of, of uh, being able to reject a, a null hypothesis of these are identical distributions? But doing that check on, on these data sets, regardless of how you do it. If you're a Java or Scala person, you, you want to you know, use Apache Commons Math 3, cool. The math is the same. You're a Python person, you want to use pandas, stats models, and, and SciPy, go for it. You're an R person, R can do all of that and more. Uh, it doesn't matter what tool you use. It just matters you should be looking at that. Because if you don't, it's going to blow up in your face. Like it's blown up in my face over a dozen times. Where I was like, I didn't think this was going to drift. Oh, man, <laughs> our predictions are so bad right now. I really wish I had monitored this. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and I want to get into war stories in a bit. I think there is a really important part, too, that you said before, which is, let's say we're getting that wake-up call at 2 a.m., and it seems to me like monitoring is something where you want to make sure that you're monitoring for those like outliers. You're not really monitoring for things that are kind of going wrong, or am I off on that? Uh, depends on the severity of the nature of your model, is what I would say. Um, there, there's a lot of models that are out there that are companies kind of see as, as almost like a plaything. Uh, they're like, yeah, it's really cool, we're doing ML, but it doesn't really run the business. Uh, and that's unfortunate when I see stuff like that. I'm like, no, this is actually really important. You should put more investment. But that's that's a culture thing. Uh, and most companies will eventually realize how powerful, uh, well-crafted ML can be. Um, but for those instances, yeah, monitor it. But if it's not really running the business, it's not something that requires a 2 a.m. wake up. Um, it's not that critical. There are startups out there uh, that I've worked with where if a model starts drifting a little too much, that affects 80% of their revenue. Uh, they will be insolvent if they let that run poorly for weeks on end. Mm -hmm. So people take that extremely seriously. There is entire teams of people just doing real-time monitoring of models that do critical predictions like that. Um, some of the other industries we work with, like industrial manufacturing industries, uh, oil and oil and gas and stuff, they're running models that are predicting failure on billion-dollar pieces of equipment. If that model drifts, uh, or is usually those are pretty stable, but they can theoretically drift. Um, but monitoring of those processes, if if that's wrong, you could be. It's the difference between a hundred thousand dollar repair uh, for a uh, preventative maintenance versus a billion dollars replacement cost. So companies take that very seriously. Yeah, or an environmental disaster, I imagine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So the other thing that I, I always wonder about with monitoring is how you, when you talk about this, like, especially when it's very, very crucial to the business, how do you stay out of alert hell and just getting pinged all the time? And 90% of these times that you're getting alerts, it's not something that you need to really focus time and attention on. Yeah, so I, I very rarely ever do hard-coded limits on anything. Uh, because of my previous life before doing data science work, working in factories, I was exposed to uh, Western electric rules, statistical process control. 
So there's rules associated with those and there's selective rules you can choose to use some of them. I never recommend to use all of them because they're kind of crazy, but uh, you can set these rules and conditionally program them in sort of a hierarchical fashion within your code base, within your monitoring code. It doesn't have to be super sophisticated. It's uh, Some of it is just if else chains or mapping, uh, case matching and stuff. But what you're doing is you're saying, hey, if, the, if I'm oscillating within these standard deviation bounds on this particular feature, and that's fine for me, then don't write a rule that says, oh, I have, I'm going between, you know, around the mean too many times in a row. That's more for, you know, detecting bimodality in, in a factory process. Don't use that. But if you have something where, okay, I'm trending seven days in a row up past one standard deviation, and it's indicating that this this feature is drifting extensively, then set a rule with that and say, I need to hit this condition on this rolling window that I'm monitoring for me to be woken up at night. Uh, hopefully it's not a woken up at night. Usually it's better to schedule that stuff at like 8 a.m. and like, okay, that's what we're doing today is fixing this. But all of those rules, and there's a lot of them that you can you can write. You just customize them for the problem at hand, the nature of the data, and what how important it is to fix this quickly. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that idea of automatically retraining when you get some kind of uh, alert or you don't even have to get the alert. You just, the model drifts to a certain extent and then it re-triggers that CICD pipeline you were talking about. And why that isn't necessarily recommended and why it's such a hard thing to do and to get correct I mean, certain use cases, it, it is legitimate to use a, a, an active learning uh, framework like that. It's just not something I recommend to, for somebody to build from scratch when they're doing their first production deployment. It's more of, okay, we've been running this model for six months and we've had to change it four times and we've evaluated what the nature of the data is that's coming in. We have an understanding of the space of how this has historically required us to trigger a retraining. So let's automate that. And let's say we're going to detect these conditions where this becomes a problem. And if those conditions are met, then we just auto retrain. And every time we retrain, we use the same process and procedure. We have these validation checks and now the model performs better. Uh, I'm a big fan of keeping things simple uh, as much as possible instead of introducing complexity and complication to code bases just because you can or because you think it's going to be a problem. Like, don't build something unless you need it. Uh, it. It's just it's just more code you have to maintain. It's more things that can break. Um, but there are plenty of use cases where it's absolutely critical for you to build those systems. For instance, what we were talking about before, that, that uh, fraud detection model. A lot of companies build automation around that because of the nature. If you're trying to detect credit card fraud uh, at a bank, um, hackers are are doing new things every single day, sometimes every single hour. So a lot of those models need to be retrained either daily or when new threats are detected, saying we have a threat monitoring system that's external to the ML aspect, and we have a team of 300 people that work in this department that are detecting abnormal behavior associated with charge patterns. Um, when you start having those flagged by the algorithm as saying, nope, it's all good. This is a normal person doing normal things. And then the fraud department starts saying, like, no, like these are these 18 things, these transaction histories are very abnormal and are definitely fraudulent. That feedback loop will go back and say, auto retrain and and here's the new label data that we've we've assigned to this so that it can learn that new pattern as quickly as possible and then do either an A-B test deployment or uh, you can just do validation checks and say, okay, there's a human in the loop saying, yes, this is approved, release now. Uh, so the, in those situations, it's absolutely critical about how fast things change in the world. And I know one question that's come up quite a bit is monitoring when it takes a long time for you to get the validation or the ground truth. Like how do you monitor in the right way or what's the best way to monitor when you don't know if that prediction 
is true for another month. There's no free lunch. Uh, reality is, is reality. Uh, there's plenty of use cases where you're trying to influence something that you might, it might take six months for you to get the, the result of that to come back. Um, hopefully you have as many monitoring stages as you can about the features coming in that are being made, uh, that are being used to make predictions and can monitor the state and the nature of the predictions that are coming out. Uh, just to make sure that interactions between features aren't causing a, an actual label drift where all of a sudden you're like, hey, we, we're, we're doing a Boolean prediction. And when we first released this thing, it was a 90-10 a split of not happen, happen. And over time, the predictions start being 50-50. That's causing for an alarm to say, did something fundamentally change here? And when I see things like that, where those shifts can actually occur, uh, sometimes the best thing to do is move away from correlation modeling and start looking at Bayesian implementations of like Markov chains, where you say, we're going to try a causality analysis here and figure out well, what in these features and why is actually causing this, this prediction to drift. Mm. So I see Karsten's going for the free book. <laughs> He's asking a question in here, question slash statement. I differentiate between model and data drift on a high level. Do you think that data drift or da do you think that data drift monitoring is still necessary when you get ground truth faster than model decays? Because in my opinion, data drift often is monitored just to estimate the model drift when ground truth is not available. That's an excellent question. Um, if you have almost instant feedback to a, a model prediction to get you a validated quality metric associated with the model, uh, you don't have to have all of this intense monitoring of, of each of the features. It's important to understand the shape and nature of that data just in general, because depending on the model implementation that you're using, uh, that nature of that data, uh, a lot of people are using tree-based algorithms. I see XGBoost everywhere these days. Uh, but it, if you're using some of these, these gradient-boosted implementations, if the distribution changes on a particular feature, uh, it's going to change the way that the entropy calculation is is happening because of where the boundary separation is going to occur on continuous variables. If the the actual ordinal count of uh, you know card when you have a cardinality change in a categorical feature within um, an index position that's going into a model like that, that's going to change how the split occurs and what the calculations are. So I always monitor the distributions of things. Uh, even sometimes it's just simple and monitoring the mean of, of each feature and the standard deviation and then calculating the skew and saying how stable is that over time. If I'm getting a fast response to a, a target and I can know within minutes uh, of a prediction being made how good the model is, then I'm basing retraining and alerting on that quick feedback loop that I'm getting, but I'm doing model re-architecture and uh, refactoring based on the nature of the feature data coming in. Because sometimes a retraining event is not going to fix anything. It could actually make your model way worse. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you need to get all the information associated with the features coming in and the predictions to say, hey, it's it's time to make version 2.0 of this model. Like We need a new feature vector. We need to re rethink how we're doing this. We might need a completely different algorithm because the state and nature of this no longer supports uh, our data. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, hopefully I answered it <laughs> fairly well. I thought that was a great answer. Karsten will tell us in the chat. Yeah, he says, yes, it was. So <laughs> Matt was asking a question and this was actually, Matt, you read my mind because this was one of the questions I was going to ask next. How do you pick good metrics to monitor? Is there any benefit to monitor the system or business level metrics? So that is chapter nine, I think, in the book. Um, long The TLDR of that entire chapter is um, controversial in the way that I talk about it. Measuring metrics is cheap. It's dirt cheap. You're calculating 
you know, a row-based vector of information where you're saying, I'm going to calculate RMSE or MSE or MAE or R squared or any of these things. Uh, aggregating data is, is usually pretty quick. Uh, doing individual calculations, even in, in a, a non-distributed system, is pretty fast. Uh, I just calculate as many as as seem relevant, and I log them all to ML, MLflow uh, for a particular use case. The reason I do that is because it's been very painful when I picked the wrong one uh, for the use case and then found out three months later, right before I'm ready to, to go into production, that the metric that I've been using to do, do hyperparameter tuning doesn't actually make much sense for the actual need of the prediction distribution, uh, particularly with stuff like classification problems. Uh, you get into the uh, a lot of use cases where you think accuracy, F1 score is the penultimate way to tune this model. And then two weeks before release, the business comes back, the SMEs are like, yeah, we had a meeting and we actually can't have any false negatives on this. So can you make that happen? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, geez, like I actually can't use this metric that I was using because it's, it's optimizing both, you know, like all four aspects of, of, uh, of the uh, confusion matrix. And I need to eat the fact that uh, I might have a, a worse false positive rate here, but I can't have false negatives. So I calculate all the metrics for uh, anything that I think might be useful, but I do that at the early experimentation phase because that's a good way of comparing different modeling approaches as well so that you can compare on a, a universal system of metrics and really decide which one uh, is the most effective. And it allows you to pivot later on if you say, I want to actually use this for hyperparameter tuning and optimize to this particular loss metric. Just having them all available and seeing the history uh, saves you a ton of time. But the business level metrics, uh, I don't ever recommend a data scientist ever decide that. Mm. I never do. I did it a couple of times uh, at pre previous companies. I'm like, oh, people want revenue. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to aggregate sales. And then I have a meeting with the CFO and they're like, how stupid are you? Like, that's not how revenue is calculated. I'm like, well, what do you mean? It's just sales, right? And they're like, no, here's the formula that we use. And it, you look at it and you're like, I should have talked to somebody from finance before trying to <laughs> aggregate this because they have... 30 years of history of like how they choose to calculate this metric and what is important for the business. So for the business level metrics, talk to the SMEs, get them to show you how they do it manually. Hopefully they have an equation. That's awesome. If they do, sometimes it's an Excel, just say, Hey, can I have a copy of your Excel document? And, you know, basically reverse engineer their, their cell math. And there you go. There's your metric for the business level. Hopefully that was a good answer. <laughs> Yeah. And you kind of answered the follow-up question to that, which Matt was asking about, like, if you have hundreds of different metrics, how do you place weight or how do you choose which ones are really the important ones? And it seems like you, you said that when you said, yeah, just experiment in the beginning, not at the end and yep. figure out which ones are important. And then you can move forward with those. Exactly. And the, the other part of that, the amount of weight behind each metric, it really depends on what the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so one of the use cases that I talked through in the book is something that I don't think gets a lot of love in the ML community, which is time series modeling, hmm. uh, particularly the old school stuff. Uh, so uh, Arima, Sarima, Saramax, uh, Holt Winters. So those sorts of uh, old school uh, time series univariate modeling there's a lot of metrics associated with, with scoring of them, but the use case that we use in the book is about building potentially thousands of those models uh, every day. And if you're trying to choose a metric that you have disparate distributions of that univariate uh, raw series, you can't use something to compare apples to apples like MSE or MAE, anything that uses the actual raw values of the, the continuous variable. So in the one of the things that I use to determine how good are these is this approach on all these different models for all these different data sets, just calculate MAPE. And MAPE, is, I would never optimize to MAPE uh, for an individual model for, for doing cross-validation, but it's a good tool to say, 
is this algorithm a good approach? Because it really sucks for JFK, but it's great for LaGuardia. And <laughs> it's an airport uh, passenger modeling problem. Um, so MAPE allows you to just level the playing field. You get this percentage, but it's just a general guess. And then you use something like, I, I typically use something like AIC or BIC in order to get that fine-tuned control when I'm doing hyperparameter tuning. Uh, but then there's a different metric that's that would be used for the business for something like that. Excellent. I'm loving these answers. And let us know if you are too in the chat. There is a question from DA. How useful do you think adaptive windowing is? Adaptive windowing with regards to like a window function or... DA, if you could give us a bit more context around that one we would greatly appreciate it drift, drift detection. detection so adapting your window so like a sliding window i'm assuming you're talking about um i think it's pretty critical it's generally how i do that drift detection i don't look at from beginning of time uh, and have some sort of metric because the nature and state of features as they're coming in are, are going to be temporal for the most part. Uh, things change over time. The universe is full of, of entropy. So as, as things change over time, if you're using a sliding window to doing that drift detection, you can do a comparison to whatever the last state is of during training as sort of a hardcore, hard-coded, like, hey, if I go way above this limit, or way below this limit, alert people. Um, but when you're looking at fine-tuned uh, rules associated, that's why I mentioned the statistical process control, that uses a, a sliding window. It's an, it's an adaptive one, and you can set how far back or how close you want to go, depending on the frequency of, of the data collection and what your aggregation state is. So, yeah, I, I think it's super important. Excellent. Now, Matt's got a, another amazing question coming through, <laughs> and I love the end of this, the punchline made me laugh. I've worked with data scientists who feel like their job is producing the model only with little or no regard to in production aspect of the model. Have you any thoughts on how we can bridge the gap between data scientists and the wider engineering team so models are produced with production in mind? Should I just add them to the on-call rotation when the project is released? Uh, man, what a loaded question, Matt. You knew I was going to respond to so just buy my book. Um, that's the whole reason I wrote this book. ML engineering, in my opinion, is a data scientist who knows how to code, um, like code properly. Uh, and that means doing experimentation in whatever way you want. You want to use scripting, imperative programming, however you do it, that's fine. But when you're talking about production and you're integrating with a larger data uh, ecosystem where you're serving models to production uh, for a website or doing something that has some real-time uh, aspect to it, or you need to interface with a very serious uh, backend infrastructure at a company, you got to learn how to code. Uh, you, whether it's functional program paradigm or object-oriented paradigm, whatever one works best for you, uh, production code is testable, you know, unit tested, integration tested, validated, monitored, logged, and it should be written in, in such a manner. And there's reasons for that. Um, so my advice is to have a, a very strong conversation with the lead of the data science team and say, hey, I think a great way to, for us to upscale the data science team is to pair with them, work on a project with them together and show them how to do that correctly and why it's important. Um, I've never seen much success with a hostile engagement like that, like blaming, finger pointing. It's not productive. But sitting down, like getting one or two backend developers uh, who know Python really well or Scala or Java and having them sit down side by side with the ML team, whoever's working on a, a serious project and showing them how to write code in a way that is production grade. Uh, that's... It's actually why I have a job where I am right now at Databricks. It's kind of what, one of the things that we do is working with people to kind of upscale them in that way uh, to create code that's not just fired or throw it across the wall, fire it across the field and say, this is your problem now. Uh, as for on-call, 
uh, when I have run data science teams in the past, uh, that's a requirement. Uh, we, I never let anybody punt something over to another team. If, if the data science team produced it, they, they're required to produce production code, monitor their own code. Their model is their responsibility. They have to write their own ETL, uh, and they have to have all the logging and monitoring set up. They don't do interfaces to a front end, like, like a website or something. That's another team, but they have to maintain their own REST API. They have to have their own Swagger definition for that API so that the front end team doesn't have to build all of that for them. Um, and it, one of the ways that you can do that is hire a couple of developers on the, the data science team. Hopefully that, that got my thought across. Huge impact, right? Like if you're making sure that these data scientists can know how to code. And I really like that you put a machine learning engineer in your eyes is someone who is a data scientist who knows how to code well and can be a pro have that programming side. There's so much to unpack there. And I think that will be something just so impactful for so many people. So I see Matt's already putting like, yes, some real food for thought. <laughs> Very cool to see. Now uh, we're running out of time. I know there's some more questions in the chat. I am going to invite everyone whose questions I did not get to. Please reach out to Ben. He is on our MLOps community Slack. So you mm -hmm. can talk to him there. We'll probably keep the discussion going if you want. Uh, and I really want to hear some more stories. Like what are, that's how I wanted to finish this. Tell us some of these, these ones that scarred you really bad. I know we've had uh, Flavio on here and he told us that he wasn't monitoring a, recommend, a recommender system and it recommended the same, it was an e-commerce site, it recommended the same product no matter what to every single person on the website for 18 days and lost them over hundreds of thousands of uh, euros because it was in Europe. So what's, can you top that one? Oh, there's some that I can't talk about because of NDAs, but <laughs> um, I can speak in general terms of, of really stupid things that I've done. Um, I have done root cause analysis stuff without doing my due diligence that if somebody, if we didn't have a process in place for human vetting of predictions, um, we could have cost a scrap event at the factory that would have been in the tens of billions of dollars of product. Um, oh. I learned from that that uh, you only get so many times as a, a data science person to mess up like that before everyone loses faith, not just in you, but in your entire team and the reason why that team might be in existence. So it was a huge lesson learned uh, to be like, hey, we actually have to take this super seriously because it's it's not just our team's reputation or our jobs that are on the line. It's our entire industry, um, our entire profession is on the line with a major employer internationally. Um, so yeah, I, I got good and and started to do a lot of research, read a lot of stuff that people that are far smarter than me have written in, in books and started to grok that and be like, okay, this is the type of stuff that I need to, to employ here to have a check and balance. Uh, and stupidly, even my response to that was, I'm going to automate this because I'm learning how to automate stuff. And I think this is so cool and code is awesome. And all of that was thrown away uh, for a much simpler approach was, Hey, before I release one of these reports, um, I'm just going to analyze the the results here and make sure that, that this actually <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. And then I'm going to send it over to uh, uh, the human element of it, which was I made friends in uh, every department of the factory. Uh, a good way to do that is um, from a data science perspective see what they like. Do they like coffee? Do they like beer? Do they like wine? Uh, invite them out somewhere for lunch uh, or after work, have a chat with them, get to know them. And then 
have a good rapport with them where they can teach you stuff about what they do and the deep knowledge that they have about what you're trying to predict on. And then they're also your final SME check before you, you uh, fire off the air raid sirens and make everybody panic. Um, and that's carried through uh, everything from that point on through my career about understanding the importance of, of building relationships with people who know more than I do about what I'm trying to predict. Uh, it's always saved me from embarrassing situations or potentially destructive uh, scenarios by just making friends with people. Wow. Excellent answers. And that is something, again, it's echoing what we've heard so many times. Like it's so important to have that subject matter expert there to help you, to help you understand what you're actually looking for and what you're trying to predict on as you said. So make some friends. That's a good one, especially. And if you can't do it in the pandemic, like you can't take them out, then shoot them over a Slack or something. Yep. Get creative. So give them a Starbucks gift card or, or whatever uh, coffee shop. Or just tell them a so, joke. Like figure out yeah. what makes them laugh. Give, you know, make a, make a, a friendly professional relationship with somebody and make it so that you want to help each other. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, that's what I tell data science teams is even if your customers are external, uh, you're doing something that's going to influence somebody who's external to your company from your prediction, you still have internal customers. And it is that SME group. Uh, be good to your internal customers and make it a partnership and it, it'll always work out better. Huge. Again, that comes back to this idea of people, ML ops and the people equation or the people aspect of it. So <laughs> that's about it for today. I think we had, I mean, we had some incredible questions. I don't know if you want to choose Ben, who, who wins a book, or maybe we give them all a book. We'll see if you had a question today i see there was matt da and karsten thank you all for participating in this and asking awesome questions do you want to choose a winner ben uh i think all three so we'll there get we you go. Some, uh, some discount codes for that so you can get a free copy there we go awesome i'm excited to to read this book now that you've given us the overview and we've been able to hear your wisdom and your insights it's really special because it's speaking from a place of experience and that is very obvious so i appreciate it i really want to thank you again and thank you everyone for coming and joining us we will see you next week all right thanks so much